Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee, and a member opposed each will control 10 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First, let me just say this. It is just downright outrageous that the McGovern-Jones Amendment was ruled out of order by the Rules Committee, denying this House the opportunity to debate and vote on their amendment. Secondly, we really do need a clear and two-day, at least, debate, not 20 minutes on this critical issue of Afghanistan. So for the life of me, you know, 20 minutes is not long enough, and I don't quite understand why, in fact, the McGovern-Jones Amendment was not given the full amount of time, because the American people deserve to hear both sides of this issue from a variety of policy perspectives. My amendment today would put a responsible end to combat operation in Afghanistan by limiting the funding to the safe and orderly withdrawal of U.S. troops and military contractors. And I have to thank the co-sponsors of this bipartisan amendment, Representatives Jones and Conyers, Paul, Woolsey, Welch, Nadler, and Hastings, and all of our colleagues who have worked on this issue throughout the years to responsibly end the war in Afghanistan. I have offered this amendment in the past, and it has been a bipartisan amendment. It's clear that the American people have been far ahead of Congress in supporting an end to the war in Afghanistan. My amendment allows Congress the opportunity to stand squarely with the war-weary American people who want to bring our troops home. The call has been growing across this land to bring this war to an end. It's time now for the Congress to answer the call here today. The reality is that there is no military solution to the war in Afghanistan. Our brave troops have done everything that was asked of them and more. As the daughter of a military veteran, I also know firsthand the sacrifices and the commitment involved with defending our nation. But the truth is that they have been put in an impossible situation there's no military solution, and it's past time to end the war and to bring the troops home. Over a decade now, over $500 billion spent in direct costs, and mind you, not a penny of it has been paid for. Instead, we should have been investing in jobs and our economy here at home and a smarter national security strategy. It is time to say enough is enough. With almost 2,000 United States troops killed in Afghanistan and many tens of thousands more maimed with injuries both, both hidden and visible, we must recognize that the boots on the ground strategy in Afghanistan must end. It's critical to our economy and the future of this country that we stop pouring billions on a counterproductive military presence in Afghanistan. The American people have made it clear that the war is no longer worth fighting not for another year, not for another two years, and surely not for another 12 years. Today, Congress should stand with seven out of 10 Americans who oppose the war in Afghanistan. After 11 long years, it is time to bring our troops home. We can do that responsibly by voting yes on the Lee Amendment today. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady reserves. For purposes, gentlemen from California, seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I claim the time in opposition. The gentleman from California is recognized for 10 minutes. This time I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Thornberry. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, essentially, this amendment says get out now. Uh, leave Afghanistan regardless of the consequences. And I appreciate the honesty, the forthright nature of this amendment offered by the gentlelady from California. It, it is better to say up front what you are trying to do rather than to put various conditions on it or to tie our troops' hands in some way or, or to not put enough troops in the field in order to accomplish the mission we ask them to do. This is very clear. It says leave now. And it is tempting for all of us because we have been there for a while. I want our troops to leave as soon as possible, consistent with national security. And as a matter of fact, the underlying bill says that the United States military should, main, should not maintain an indefinite combat presence in Afghanistan and should transition to a counterterrorism and advise and assist mission at the earliest possible date, consistent with the conditions on the ground. 
And that's really the difference, consistent with the conditions on the ground. We believe that, I believe, you've got to take account what, what the situation is there. Uh, and you cannot just l abandon uh, Afghanistan and ignore, stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not going to have consequences. I think it's important to remember why we're there to the begin with. We're not there because of them. We're there because of us. We're there to make sure that Afghanistan is no longer used as a safe haven, as a base from which, which will be used to launch attacks against us. That's the crux of the matter. As soon as they are able to provide for their own security and prevent a return of the Taliban, a return of al-Qaeda, then we can go and we will have accomplished our mission and they'll have to sort through their domestic issues on their own. But if we leave too early and al-Qaeda and the Taliban return and use it as a base to launch attacks against us, then I'm afraid more Americans will suffer uh, and we, will see, we could see repeats of past terrorist attacks. So. As tempting as it is, Mr. Chairman, we cannot ignore the consequences of our actions. Leaving too fast would be bad for our security. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California is Thank recognized. you. I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentlelady from California, Congresswoman Woolsey. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Woolsey, is recognized for two minutes. I rise today in support of my friend Barbara Lee's amendment. Uh, let's look at the facts. Two-thirds of Americans oppose our military occupation of Afghanistan. So, if the American people were to vote on this amendment today, it would pass overwhelmingly with support from both Democrats and Republicans. After nearly 11 years, Mr. Chairman, enough is enough. Congress must catch up to the people they represent and embrace a responsible end to this war. Instead of dumping $10 billion a month into an unwinnable war, let's redirect our resources towards a smart security approach. Let's invest in people. Let's invest in development. Let's invest in humanitarian progress. Let's bring our troops home. Vote yes on the Lee Amendment. Vote yes for smart security. Vote yes for the American people. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. At this time, Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from uh, Texas, member of the committee, Mr. Conway. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the uh, chairman yielding the time. Uh, I stand in opposition to this amendment. Uh, my colleague stated it uh, very well earlier. This is simply just get out now. And uh, my colleagues across the aisle in support of this amendment have continued to use the word responsible over and over, and there's nothing responsible about abandoning uh, the efforts in, in Afghanistan today uh, without uh, the proper conditions on the ground. Uh, the president has a plan in place. Some of us may have had uh, differing uh, ideas with him, but he put a plan in place and says our combat troops will be out of there by uh, 2014, contingent with the conditions on the ground. Um, the Afghan people are responsible for their own security, and we're trying to help them get to that place with the Afghan National Army, the Afghan National Police, the Afghan local army. Those efforts are going, across, going on across the, the provinces of uh, Afghanistan as we speak, and they're getting into the lead uh, uh, to take care of their security. But abandoning of Afghanistan today would put at risk 27 million Afghanis who have counting on us to get this right, counting on us to put them in a position to be able to defend themselves uh, when we do leave in 2014. So getting out now, Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker, is uh, uh, responsible, is irresponsible uh, rather than responsible. Now, I understand all of us are tired. All of us are weary. None of us uh, like to go to those uh, funerals. I go to the funerals of the young men and women uh, who've been injured and c killed uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I stand with those, peop those moms and dads and husbands and wives on the worst day of their lives. And I understand it's grinding grief that is associated with it, but there's a pride also attached to that, that their loved one gave their life uh, for something positive, for something good, that 27 million Afghanis could, could uh, create a government that would allow them to, uh, to rule themselves and not have the thugs of the Taliban uh, do what they did in the middle mid-90s, uh, come in and slaughter all the thoughtful people, all the teachers, all the folks who would lead in order to uh, subjugate that people in ways that are just horrendous. They will do that again. Uh, to anyone who has helped us over this last 10-year period. So we do have a responsibility there. The responsibility is to get out when the conditions on the ground say it's time to get out. Uh, the NATO is meeting this weekend uh, in Chicago to determine uh, ongoing conditions, uh, what's going to be done with respect to their commitments, uh, and this amendment would undermine all of those efforts that will be going on there. So I stand in opposition to the amendment. I encourage my colleagues to uh, vote no on this amendment. 
The yeah, gentleman back. yields back. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Thank you. I'd like to yield now one minute to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. I thank uh, the gentlelady from California and uh, appreciate that ending America's longest war over 10 years uh, is not an unreasonable notion because there is a serious misunderstanding going on about this amendment uh, on the other side. Withdrawing United States troops does not mean we're abandoning Afghanistan. Please, there's a difference. There are other ways that we can continue to develop uh, the diplomatic and political solutions that can't be won at gunpoint. Don't you get it? How many, uh, uh, if you're, we're leaving in 2014, we're just saying, let's speed it up. Let's begin a rational withdrawal. And we have a responsibility to keep a commitment to Afghanistan. It doesn't mean troops. It doesn't mean our military has to die. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes at this time. The gentleman from Florida, member of the committee, a gentleman who has led troops in battle, Mr. West. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to speak. And I will say this one thing. I've been in Afghanistan for two and a half years, and having been a ground combat commander, I say one thing. If this amendment were to pass, where it says this amendment would restrict the authorization and use of funds for continuation of combat operations in Afghanistan, just today in the Farah province where I've been to, the Taliban attacked an Afghan government compound, killing seven people. What you are telling to our men and women in combat, what you are saying to the enemy is that we are going to leave those men and women hanging, that we are not going to provide them the resources. Now, I see where this amendment says it does not prohibit or restrict the use of funds available for the U.S. to carry out diplomatic, humanitarian development, or general reconstruction efforts. One of the problems that we have had in Afghanistan is that we got involved in nation building, we got involved in occupation style warfare, and truly being, not being involved in counterterrorism style of warfare and going after the enemy. This is where our primary focus should be. And we have generals that are on the ground that know what they're doing. They've been to staff college. They've been to war college. Why is it that we don't want to listen to the people that we have placed trust and confidence in to lead our men and women in combat? They have been told in 2014 that we will be drawing down and leaving Afghanistan. Why in God's name? Well, we want to repeat some of the horrible things that I saw my older brother go through in Vietnam where we restricted funding, and the next thing you know, you had the killing fields of Pol Pot. I'm telling you, I've been in Afghanistan. I know this enemy, and I don't see anyone over there, my dear colleagues on the other side, that I would trust more than General Allen, who is on the ground, who knows what he has to do. The message that you send to our troops is that you're abandoning them. The message that you send to the Taliban, to Al-Qaeda, to the Haqqani Network, to LET, to every single radical Islamic group is that we have turned our backs on our military and you can continue to kill them. And I just want to say one simple thing. Two weeks ago, I went to the memorial service for PFC Michael J. Metcalf of Boynton Beach, Florida, who was laid to rest today in Arlington. I will not turn my backs on those men and women who are still my friends, some of them even my relatives. And I ask that my colleagues do not vote for this amendment. The Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California. Thank you. Mr. Chair, how much time do I have remaining? The gentlelady from California has four and a half minutes remaining. The, the uh, gentleman from California has four minutes remaining. Okay. Let me just uh, yield myself 30 seconds and just respond to the gentleman from Florida and just say this amendment, I think he's probably not reading the, the amendment that I have offered. What this uh, amendment does is restrict our funding for the purpose of the safe and the orderly withdrawal from Afghanistan of all members of the armed forces and the Department of Defense. It is not a cut and run amendment. This is a force protection amendment. It would bring our young men and women out of harm's way and it would provide the resources to move forward to help stabilize the region. I'd like now to yield a minute to the gentlelady from Hawaii, Congresswoman Hanabusa. Hawaii is recognized for one minute. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I rise in, to speak in support of the Lee Amendment. When I was in the Hawaii State Legislature, we were the only state that, that did a Hawaii Medal of Honor. And the unfortunate part about it is we gave those medals to the spouses and the families and the friends of those who had fallen in Iraq and Afghanistan. As long as they had some connection to Hawaii, either serving at one of our bases or being from there. And that when I went through that proceeding, I said, you know, as soon as we can, and I believe the time has come for us, we must safely remove our troops and the civilian personnel because we owe it to them. It is not a matter of whether or not we are, we are abdicating or we are turning our backs on them. They have done what they were sent there to do. Eleven years of fighting. Osama bin Laden is dead. The people of the United States know that. And they are asking us to remove the men and women. Don't continue them in harm's way because we have done what we told them that they were sent there to do. And that is why I stand in support of the Lee Amendment. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, at this time I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from uh, Illinois, member of the committee, Air Force pilot, Mr. Kissinger. The gentleman Kissinger. from Illinois is recognized for one minute. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, leadership isn't easy. These are lessons that we learn all through history. We learned it from Abraham Lincoln when he had to face a union that was dissolving. I learned it in officer training as a pilot in the military, and I learned it in my experience uh, overseas. Think of the sacrifice that our troops have made in Afghanistan. Now, we understand it's been too long, but think of the sacrifice they've made. And now we're getting ready, very quickly with the passage of an amendment, if this passes, to say, we're just getting out. We're not going to leave the commanders on the ground with the authority to say how we do it or what we do. What are we going to say to our troops if this passes? And what are we going to say to Bibi? Bibi is a young woman in Afghanistan who at the age of 12 was sold into slavery because somebody committed a crime in her family and the Taliban required her to be sold into slavery. She escaped and had her nose and ears cut off. Her uncle and her family turned their back on her as she tried to crawl to safety, and she went to an American Ford operating base where she was granted safety and freedom. What are we going to say to Bibi when we pick up and say, you know what, we've had enough, we're just going to pick up and leave today? This is a big deal, and I would urge my colleagues to oppose this ill-thought-out amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have remaining? The gentlelady from California has two minutes remaining. The gentleman from California has three minutes remaining. I'd like to yield now one minute to the gentlelady from Texas, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for one minute. I'd like to thank the gentlelady for a very thoughtful amendment, and I again acknowledge the amendment that uh, both Mr. Smith and Mr. McGovern had. And clearly what this is is an opportunity for the American people to speak through their representatives here on the floor of the House. None of us want to promote the killing of women, the cutting off of ears, the mutilization of anyone. I have founded and chaired the Afghan caucus. I've gone to Afghanistan many times. I've delivered books to their schools. What we are suggesting is that the precious blood of our soldiers, first going there after the horrific incident of 9-11, they, after 10 years, have given the fullest measure. And what we're suggesting is that we bring them home safely and orderly and that we begin to use the diplomatic resources, we enhance NATO, we make sure that we work with our allies and we have the Afghan National Security Forces stand up. That's what we're saying. We've given enough ribbons and hero awards because we know that our soldiers would not step away. They want to be there with their comrades. But it is important for us as members of Congress who make decisions to send young men and women into war to make a decision that their job is well done and that Afghanistan begin to, in essence, develop their democratic processes and begin to have their national security forces and their police officers stand up. Enough killing of our soldiers by internal acts by Afghan police and soldiers. Let us bring them home now in an orderly way. God bless our troops and God bless the United States of America. Gentlelady, time's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Hi, Mr. Chairman, at this time I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce. The gentleman from New Mexico is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I flew combat missions in Vietnam in 1971. 72 and 73. I was there when members of this House 
voted to cut the funds to troops in combat. I'm hearing the words safe and orderly withdrawal. Has anyone on the other side looked at the safe and orderly withdrawal that occurred in Vietnam? As we fell head over heels, we left 574 combat-ready aircraft there. That was the safe and orderly withdrawal we had when this body began to manage Vietnam. We lost the Vietnam War because we took the control of the war away from the generals and placed it into this body, people who had never been in combat, who had never been in harm's way. And I'm telling you, as someone who was there during a time when Congress choked off the funds to people that were in harm's way, I had a burning anger that burns today. And when I see this amendment and visualize the young men and women over there who you're cutting funds off and saying, we're going to leave you with an orderly and quiet withdrawal. It's not humanly possible. The other side doesn't play by your orderly rules. Understand that this is war and our troops' lives are at risk and you're putting more so yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California is recognized. I'd like to reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California side. reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, could I ask uh, the time remaining? The gentleman from California has two minutes remaining. The gentlelady from California has one minute remaining. And I have the right to close. The gentleman from California has the right to close. I'll reserve. The gentleman from California reserves. No. From okay, let me just uh, first say that uh, I appreciate this 20-minute debate, but we should have a couple of days to be able to have a full debate on why we need to, one, protect our troops and provide for their safe and orderly withdrawal. The American people are war-weary. We need to reunite our brave men and women in uniform with their families at home, we should transfer the billions of dollars that we're spending on war to creating jobs here at home. We should ensure that our troops are provided with the resources that they deserve and they need during this withdrawal. We're asking for a safe and orderly withdrawal. We're saying our young men and women have fought. They've done everything we've asked them to do. We think that now, as the American people are saying, that combat mission, the fighting should end, and we should begin by protecting our troops and contractors, and we should begin to end the longest war in American history. It's time to end the war in Afghanistan. The gentlelady's time's expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself the balance of the time. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, when I was in Afghanistan a few years ago, uh, I visited Camp Leatherneck. General Nicholson, who was just setting up base, and they were just there in the desert, and then were out setting up forward operating bases, trying to take back territory that the Taliban commanded. The general told me that his troops were being asked every day by the local people, when are you leaving? How long are you going to be here? Can we trust you to be here to protect us? Last year, when I returned, I went to uh, the same area. We were able to go to Marja this time, which we couldn't go to before because that was a Taliban stronghold. Last year we were able to walk down the street in Marja. Uh, I saw Marines and Afghan soldiers embracing that they were happy to, to see each other. Maybe they'd been apart for a while. We were able to, uh, the Marines had put up light standards down the, down the street and the merchants were able to keep their stores open a little bit longer. We opened a school while we were there, not a school like we enjoy, but it was a school built out of adobe and tents. They had 500 kids, about a third of them were girls. They were able to go to school that they hadn't been able to go to before. They were excited about that opportunity. I visited with the local governor there. We had lunch. I asked him what, what motivated him because he knew as the Taliban came back for the spring effective, his life was on the line. He said, God willing, will prevail. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, I think when we talk about pulling these people out before they have a chance to complete their mission, I was on a street fair in uh, Simi Valley last week and I talked to a lady working in a booth for the troops. She said, my grandson just came home from Afghanistan and I told him, we ought to just get out of there. And he said, Granny, that's wrong. We're accomplishing great things. We're helping those people. Let us finish our mission. That's what the generals say they should do. That's what the troops say they should do. Defeat this amendment. 
that pulls the troops out immediately. I the, yield back. The gentleman yields back. This is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The Mr. amendment is not chairman, agreed to. Mr. Chairman, on that, I'd ask for a recorded vote. The gentlelady who seeks a recorded vote pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from California will be postponed. In order to consider amendment number six printed in House Report 112-485, for what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number six printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, and a member opposed, each will control five, chair, five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. I thank the chair. I first want to congratulate the chairman and the ranking member and their respective staffs for once again offering us a model for bipartisan collaboration on major legislation. This particular amendment addresses the future drawdown in Afghanistan, which will require NATO to remove $30 billion of equipment from Afghanistan by the end of 2014. This includes everything from vehicles to armor to equipment. Logistically speaking, this is quite a challenge. The United States and its allies have relied on two major routes to transport equipment to Afghanistan the ground lines of communication, which is the NATO supply route, and the northern distribution network through Central Asia. For nearly six months, Pakistan has closed the NATO troop supply route in response to the accidental shooting of Pakistani troops on the border. While recent talks between us on the subject have been positive, the final outcome is far from certain. This simple amendment addresses the issue head-on by withholding funds to the Coalition Support Fund until the Secretary of Defense certifies that Pakistan has opened the ground lines of communication, is allowing the transit of NATO supplies through Pakistan into Afghanistan, and three, is supporting retrograde of U.S. equipment out of Afghanistan. Drawing down from Afghanistan will be no easy feat, and it will require the cooperation of our allies no matter how strained the ties. Several recent developments have caused some of my colleagues to question why we continue to engage with Pakistan at all. Well, Secretary of State Clinton said it best. Pakistan is a nuclear armed state sitting in the crossroads of a strategic region, and we have seen the cost of disengaging from that region before. Simply put, we have a national security interest in maintaining the bilateral relationship. The presence of several competing actors in South and Central Asia necessitates ongoing U.S. engagement in the region. A key requirement for a successful transition to a post-Taliban Afghanistan is a deep and nuanced understanding of all the players in the region. This includes each actor's desired endgame and its willingness to work toward a peaceful Afghanistan ruled by the Afghans. Equivocal statements and doublespeak by any party frankly impedes that progress. As the United States prepares to complete the transition, we should clearly outline our mission, identify our allies, and specify our expectations. This amendment does just that. Mr. Chairman, I also want to take a moment to express my appreciation again to the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Committee for working with me on this and other provisions in the bill. Specifically, I'm grateful to the Committee's collaboration on two initiatives to promote competition among advanced small businesses to ensure the federal agencies are issuing accurate size standards and to strengthen America's small businesses and save taxpayer money. I also appreciate the Committee's support of a bipartisan amendment, Amendment Number 96, I submitted along with Mr. Langford of Oklahoma to combat human, trafficker, uh, human trafficking by federal subcontractors. I think it will go a long way to addressing that problem. Uh, and uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I claim time in, uh, in opposition to the amendment, although I don't oppose the amendment. Does any member claim time in opposition? That objection, the gentleman is recognized. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, we had an amendment earlier to cut off all funds to Pakistan. Uh, this is a more moderate approach. Uh, Pakistan is part of the problem. We understand that. Uh, they live in a tough neighborhood. We know that in some ways they help us, in some ways they don't help us. Uh, this amendment is kind of a carrot and stick approach. We say 
when you do the things that you say you'll do, when you open these ground lines of communication, we'll be giving you some of the funds. I think that's the proper approach that we should take, and I think that will help us in moving forward our effort in that area. I thank the gentleman for his amendment. I think it makes the bill stronger. Thank him for his work in this regard. I ask support of the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Virginia. Uh, may I inquire how much time uh, is left on the gentleman has two minutes remaining. Two minutes remaining. I uh, yield a, a minute to the distinguished ranking member of the committee. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of this amendment as well as was discussed earlier. We certainly have problems with our relationship with Pakistan. We want to make sure that we continue to put the pressure on them to improve that relationship. Opening up these supply lines are critical to our troops. I think it is a minimum requirement that we should ask. I think the gentleman's amendment is very well thought out and is the appropriate response uh, for dealing with our difficult ally. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Rohrabacher mentioned earlier, certainly there is much that Pakistan does that causes us trouble, uh, but they are a country that we need to work with if we're going to properly contain uh, the al-Qaeda and terrorist threat that comes from that region of the world. And I think the gentleman from Virginia's amendment strikes that balance just right, and I urge this body to support it. With that, I yield back. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Chair, and I thank my colleagues. I uh, now yield 30 seconds to the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee. Gentlelady from Texas is recognized for 30 seconds. Let me thank the gentleman uh, for his uh, hard work, and, and let me have an open letter to our friends in Pakistan, Pakistani Americans, that uh, your friendship is appreciated. The hard work uh, that uh, we have done together is appreciated, but we are looking to begin the reopening of those borders that are crucial uh, to the survival and the efforts of our men and women who are presently uh, in Afghanistan and on that border. And I would also say uh, that with the leadership of the new ambassador, uh, with the uh, efforts that have been made by the foreign minister of Pakistan, they understand and have made uh, announcements uh, that they would begin the opening of those uh, lines, not only of communication but travel, and we would hope uh, that that would happen soon. Again, I emphasize working with the Pakistani people is crucial. Developing allies is crucial in that very difficult neighborhood where Pakistanis themselves are subject to terrorist acts, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Chairman from Virginia. I thank my colleague. Again, I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member and their wonderful staff for their hard work in this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion chair, the ayes have it. Chairman. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. General from Mr. Virginia. Chairman, I would respectfully request a recorded vote on that matter. Uh, the question. <laughs> Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report 112-485. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report Number 112-485, offered by Mr. Rooney of Florida. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rooney, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I might consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, my amendment simply codifies in the NDAA that any foreign uh, terrorist uh, detained be tried in a military tribunal uh, as set up by this Congress rather than an Article III court. And the reason for that is quite simple. Article III courts, which are reserved for our citizens, uh, afford constitutional rights, rights of attorneys, rights to remain silent, uh, right to face your accuser and to contradict the evidence that's brought against you, uh, sometimes which are being offered by the government, uh, by people in the intelligence community, uh, with information and sources that need to be protected. Uh, military tribunals, I think, are the more adequate venue for foreign terrorist enemy combatants to be tried and to be given due process fairly, which would also protect our sources, which would also protect the way that we gather evidence by men and women in uniform and panels of men and women in uniform of which I had the pleasure of serving in the United States Army JAG Corps, people of the utmost integrity and the utmost fairness. Um, 
uh, and specifically in light of the fact that uh, despite the fact that we move further away from 9-11, the war on terror continues as we've seen with Abdul Matalb in the underwear bomber, as we've seen with Major Nadal Hassan in the Fort Hood shootings, as we've seen with the Times Square bombing, as we've seen with just recently, as, as recently as last week, uh, a second attempt at, at an underwear type bombing um, uh, on an airplane. And so for these reasons and, the, and for reasons stated previously with regard to detainees at Guantanamo Bay who are not U.S. citizens, who are foreign terrorist detainees that I believe should get due process, that I believe uh, have the due process uh, venue of the military tribunals and military court down at Guantanamo Bay to get their day in court and, uh, and get so in a fair way that uh, is humane and just. And um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington. I rise to claim time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. I do not oppose military commissions. I think military commissions are an important tool, particularly when you're talking about people who are captured overseas, uh, potentially in Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia. I agree with the gentleman that there are instances when the evidence necessary um, requires a military commission. But the problem with this amendment is it says it has to be a military commission, that Article III courts are never an option. And we have an extensive history of capturing terrorists overseas, bringing back them back to the United States, trying them in Article III courts, convicting them and putting them in prison. Uh, we've done that a number of different times, and it is an option that should be on the table. I cannot support taking that option completely away under any circumstances, because there are a couple of problems with military commissions. They are necessary for many of the reasons that Mr. Rooney stated. However, they are also relatively new. We had some military commissions during World War II, I believe just one for um, a particular group of, uh, of German uh, spies who are here in the U.S., and we've done a couple since then, but they're, they're untested. There will undoubtedly be appeals. Uh, the beauty of the Article III courts is you have 230 years of history. Um, my math may be off a little bit there, but you have over 200 years of history, let's put it that way. It's well developed, and you know what's coming, you can prepare the evidence accordingly. We don't know what's going to come from a military commission. The second problem with military commissions is our overseas allies are not as fond of them as we are. And it may inhibit our ability to get them to turn terrorists over to us for prosecution if they know they have to go to military commissions. It, this amendment doesn't make any sense. To take Article III courts completely off the table is taking an option away from the president from this country to properly protect us. And there are going to be instances when we're going to want to use that tool and other instances when we want to use the military commissions. But this amendment takes away that option in a way that I believe will hamper national security. It will limit our options for how to prosecute terrorists. And I will say this again, and I'll emphasize this. We seem to have totally lost track of the fact that the Department of Justice, the FBI, our Article III courts have been one of the most important tools in successfully stopping the terrorists. Over 400 tried, convicted, and locked up for life. That is a very effective tool. The FBI knows how to investigate crimes. They know how to interrogate suspects. They can do the job. Why would we take that tool in our toolbox and throw it away? It doesn't make sense, and for that reason, I have to oppose this amendment. I uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Florida. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield uh, 90 seconds to my friend from Arkansas, Mr. Griffin. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for 90 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I stand uh, in support of Mr. Rooney's amendment, this amendment that requires all detainees currently held at Guantanamo Bay to be tried by military commissions in the courtroom facility there. Uh, it is a, is a strong amendment. Uh, we, I visited Gitmo. It was the first trip that I took when I got to Congress and they had the facilities and the expertise there. I'm also currently serving as a JAG officer in the Army in my 16th year, and I believe that is the appropriate place to try them. Article III courts are not equipped to try foreign terrorists. The constitutional legal standards for evidence gathering and prosecution in a civilian case are simply not adequate for the trial of an enemy combatant. These cases often rely on classified evidence, informants, and intelligence operatives. Military commissions, on the other hand, are set up to protect critical intelligence 
officials and evidence while still providing fair and, uh, and due process for the accused. And I will also note that bringing uh, terrorists up to New York City is a, is a very expensive proposition and uh, my constituents have made it clear to me that they want the terrorists kept where they are at Gitmo, where our state-of-the-art facility houses them. We've spent millions of dollars there, including a large courtroom to, tr to try detainees. It makes no sense to spend millions more to bring them here for trials when we have the facility and the process to try them at Gitmo. I'm confident that trying enemy combatants in military tribunals at Gitmo is the best way to hold terrorists accountable, keep them out of the United States, and prevent them from rejoining the fight. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, may I inquire as how much time is remaining? Gentleman has two and one half minutes remaining. Thank you. I yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you very much. I, I rise in opposition to the amendment. If uh, if a suspected terrorist can only be tried successfully in a military commission because there are concerns about jeopardizing the confidentiality of classified information or, or other concerns, then I emphatically agree that person should be tried in, a, tried in a military commission. But to presuppose that all such detainees properly belong in a military commission, I think is a mistake for two reasons. First, it really prejudges the record of evidence and the standing of law in that case when we're not necessarily competent to do that. That's a decision the prosecutors ought to make. And then secondly, I think although it's not the intention of the authors, I'm sure, it belies a certain lack of confidence in our constitutional system of criminal justice. We should be proud of our system. It's one that operates on principles of fairness. It fairly and expeditiously determines guilt or innocence. And I think to abandon that system in all cases under all circumstances not only unwisely prejudges the facts of these cases but also unwittingly undercuts confidence in our Constitution and our Article III courts. For that reason I would urge a no vote on this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Florida. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I inquire as to time? Gentleman from Florida has one minute remaining. Gentleman from Washington has one minute remaining. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I reserve. Gentleman reserved. Gentleman from Washington. Is that correct? Washington has the right to close. Okay, then I will reserve. Gentleman from Florida. I only have, only have one speaker left. Gentleman from Florida is recognized for one minute. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would just uh, I would just say to um, some of the things that have been said that. I don't think that what this amendment is saying is in, in any way disparaging what Article III courts can do or would be successful doing. And certainly I would agree that they could be adequate in, in um, prosecuting criminals and people that do uh, crimes uh, in this country. What we are talking about are foreign enemy terrorist combatants, people that commit acts of war against this country in furtherance of the authorization that this Congress passed. What, what we have done as a Congress is set up military commissions in ways that can protect evidence, ways that can protect witnesses and sources, in my opinion, in a way that the Article III courts uh, might not be able to. I'm not saying that they couldn't. I'm saying that it's a better venue. Just like when we talk about earlier the uh, ranking member Smith and Amash am amendment which would preclude the use of military tribunals much as the ranking member is saying that options should be on the table we're saying the same thing and so with that uh, I, I hope people will vote for this amendment and I yield back the balance of my time uh, I yield myself the balance of my time that was recognized for one minute Three quick points. I think the difference here and the reason that I drafted my amendment to say just in the U.S., I think it's a legitimate point. Overseas, we do not have the same control over the investigatory process that we have here domestically. There's a clear difference between dealing with someone here domestically. That's why in the last 
10 years, we haven't done anything other than try people here in the U.S. under Article III courts. We haven't needed military commissions. That's why I think we should take that power away from the president, because it's an extraordinary amount of power to give him that isn't necessary. But overseas, they are, in fact, taking away the options in this amendment and saying it has to be military tribunals. And they are also saying that Article III courts are inadequate to do that, when, in fact, they've done it repeatedly. The people who committed the bombing against the World Trade Towers in 1993 were captured overseas, brought back, tried here in domestic courts. Article III courts work sometimes in these instances. Their amendment takes those options away completely. Also point out that Guantanamo Bay is not an enormous facility. They already have 40 people waiting in line for military tribunals. Many more will backlog that. But I want to come back to, to my amendment that's going to come up later. Domestically, we have proven that Article III courts are more than adequate. Overseas, we've proven that we need multiple options. So this amendment sort of is in reverse of what the facts bear out that we should be doing, and I urge opposition to it. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, gentleman from I, Washington. I do ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 8, printed in House Report 112-485. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. In House Report Number 112-485, offered by Mr. Bartlett of Maryland. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, this is a, a very simple amendment. I would first like to make two statements that I think are generally recognized facts. Um, one of those is that only 11.8 percent of our workforce belongs to a, a PLA. And secondly, that PLA contracts in the government on the average cost the taxpayer 12 to 18 percent more than a non-PLA contract. Our amendment is very simple. It is not prescriptive. It is simply permissive. It says that the government will not discriminate in awarding contracts, whether you are PLA, not PLA, whether it's a mixture of PLA and non-PLA companies, that they will be considered equally and fairly. If, in fact, a PLA contractor is more efficient as they, uh, and more, does better quality work as they contend, then that will be taken into account in the award of the contract. You do not have to award to lowest bidder. You can award on the basis of best value. I think that this amendment is a common sense amendment that anybody who believes in a free enterprise system ought to support, and I reserve the balance of my time. Reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut rise? I claim time in opposition, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong opposition to my friend Mr. Bartlett's uh, amendment, which uh, in fact does the opposite of what it was purported. Uh, Presently, the status quo allows the Department of Defense to have two choices. Yes, they can use a project labor agreement or a pre-hiring labor agreement that establishes terms and conditions of employment, or now they can elect not to enter into a PLA. The effect of this amendment would, in fact, remove the Department's ability to have a PLA requirement in terms of hiring terms and conditions. And the reason why those uh, models work right now and have worked for decades is it gives the Department of Defense the opportunity to set conditions regarding security screening, apprenticeship programs, uh, veteran hiring programs, I mean it, the, harm, the Helmets to Hard Hats program which is one of the most successful programs of, of integrating veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan into the building trades uh, is done under a PLA arrangement and it also allows uh, uh, local uh, uh, job markets to be incorporated into military construction projects. But again, the department now presently has the option not to use PLAs. This amendment would in fact rob the department of that opportunity and I would retain or uh, uh, hold on to the balance of my time. There's the balance of his time. Gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes to my friend from Arizona, Mr. Flake. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for two I minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I rise in support of the Bartlett uh, Flake amendment. Uh, let me just clear something up if I can. What has happened, the President issued an executive order where he encouraged the federal agencies to, where they can, where appropriate, to employ PLAs. That might seem fine. The problem is some of the federal agencies have taken that to mean 
that they should require PLAs, and some of them have issued guidance to that effect. And so they have taken what the president said and taken it one step further. So what we're trying to do here is simply say that you cannot favor PLAs, nor can you prohibit them, that the federal agencies will be neutral in this regard. So to say that it would prohibit the use of PLAs is simply not true. We're simply trying to get, uh, keep the president or the federal agencies from putting their finger on the scale uh, in favor of PLAs or against them. So that's what this amendment does, and I, I'm proud to support it. Uh, let me just say that this amendment was offered in the Appropriations Committee yesterday uh, on the military construction bill and was passed by voice vote. There is a recognition that the president has, unwittingly or not, put his finger on the scale in favor of PLAs or union shops, and that's just not fair. The president and the agencies ought to be neutral in this regard. PLAs might make sense. They might not. What we ought to do is ensure that the taxpayer gets the biggest bang for the buck. That's the purpose of this amendment. That's why I support it. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Connecticut. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to uh, the gentleman from Mass uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to the Bartlett Flake Amendment. Uh, this amendment would indeed seek to prohibit uh, agencies from, from using a PLA, and it is not a, as the gentleman from Arizona has just stated. Let me clear something up. Large-scale construction projects, look, I, I was an iron worker for 18 years. I have run work. I have an iron worker foreman, an iron worker general foreman. Uh, PLAs are a great advantage to have in a complex uh, construction project. This, this amendment and the PLA provision that's already in the President's executive order applies to projects that are $25 million and over. So all of those projects below $25 million don't get affected by the PLA uh, uh, executive order. What the PLA does require, as Mr. Courtney has pointed out, it, it does require compliance with statutory compliance with workers' comp law, statutory compliance with anti-discrimination law, with proper classification of workers, with health and safety laws uh, on some very dangerous, dangerous job sites. This is a good idea to, to reject uh, uh, the Bartlett Flake Amendment, allow the PLAs to be used when appropriate. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to Mr. Wahlberg from Michigan. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Speaker, I stand in strong support of this amendment, an amendment that I, th I think speaks to uh, rationality of our contracting, and especially when we think of what we're talking about here in our defense world. Uh, it's one thing to have PLAs that uh, virtually uh, make unfair competition for 86 percent of all of our construction contact tractors because 86 percent nationwide don't have PLA agreements, are non-union, and yet have skilled workers doing the jobs they're expected. For defense contracting to have a mandate that there must be a PLA agreement in place uh, oftentimes will put our, our defense industry at accepting uh, a product that is more expensive and potentially uh, it, of lesser quality in the process. This is not a mandate. This says choice can be made either way, and I think it needs to be made very clear. That's all we're saying. It is neutral. It is not as described by others that this would take PLAs out of the mix. I stand in strong support for this and ask that uh, uh, this amendment be applied and ultimately uh, make a stronger defense capability for our country. I yield back. Gentleman from Connecticut. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to the gentlelady uh, from Hawaii who is a member of the Armed Services Committee, Ms. Hanabusa. The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much. I rise in opposition to the Bartlett Amendment because I think the Bartlett Amendment doesn't quite understand what a project labor agreement is and the difference between a collective bargaining agreement. This amendment targets the Executive Order 13502, which encourages the use of PLAs in construction contracts of 25 million or more. And the reason is that it's historically something that we have supported. Ironically, in 1992, there was a Supreme Court decision that defines PLAs, and it was called the Boston Harbor Agreement. It was under President Bush, who had a similar executive order that prohibited the use of PLAs. It was 
Bush's solicitor, Kenneth Starr, that argued for the PLAs. And he said the reason why you would use them is because of timely completion, labor peace and stability, labor supply, and for public purpose. This is the reason why you would use PLAs. What the Bartlett Amendment does is it will tie the hands of the Department of the Defense, which we know historically has been one of the best ways to do these major construction projects. I yield back. Gentleman from Maryland. Speaker, may I inquire how much time remains? The gentleman from Maryland has one and one, ha or one and one half minutes remaining. The gentleman from Connecticut has two minutes remaining. I yield uh, one minute to my good friend from Georgia, Mr. Gingry. Gentlemen, recognize for one minute. Mr. Chairman, I rise today in support of Amendment Number Eight, the Bartlett Flake Amendment to HR 4310. The amendment will prevent the DoD from requiring contractors to sign expensive union-favored project labor agreements as a condition of winning federal construction contracts for projects authorized by the bill. Under PLA, a construction firm must agree to sign a union collective bargaining agreement, whether it's unionized or not, before it can bid on a government project. PLAs can result in increased cost to contractors and taxpayers by as much as 18 percent unnecessary procurement delays and political favoritism in the federal procurement process. At a time when the Department of Defense is facing devastating across-the-board cuts, it simply does not make sense to encourage PLAs. And I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Connecticut. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield uh, one minute to Mr. Uh, LaTourette from Ohio. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute. Yielding, and uh, we've seen this amendment a number of times in the 112th Congress, and sadly it doesn't get any better. It's based upon the misconception that somehow PLAs are costing the taxpayer money. The definitive research was done uh, by the Department of Veterans Affairs that concluded it really depends on what part of the country you're in and whether you have a heavily unionized workforce in your area or you don't. They concluded that PLAs are productive and actually come in on time, under budget, in areas where you have a, a heavy unionized workforce and not so much in areas where you don't. And that makes sense because you've got to bring people in to do the work. The amendment, I, I think, you know, it, it's being billed as we just want people to give a choice, but come on. Uh, the people that are advocating this hate PLAs. They don't want PLAs. They want to kill project labor agreements. And so this was craftily uh, uh, drafted by the Associated Builders and Contractors to pretend that we're going to give people a choice when they really don't want people to have a choice. Please reject this. We don't have to, we don't have to go out. Uh, and uh, the President's executive order is clear. You can, all it says is you have to consider PLAs in the mix, and I urge us to reject the amendment. Gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I have a long list of uh, organizations supporting this amendment that I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record. The gentleman's request will be covered under general relief. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, maybe it's because I'm a scientist, but I'm having some trouble understanding how an amendment that specifically says that it is non-discriminatory, that it's going to be totally agnostic to whether an organization is PLA or not PLA, somehow excludes PLAs from contention. That is certainly not what the amendment does. I think this is a very common sense, and I don't think that, that, that few Americans would like to exclude nearly 90 percent of American workers from contention for federal contracts. This is a fair, common sense amendment, and I urge its acceptance by both sides. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. To conclude, uh, again, there is a myth that somehow President Obama's executive order has uh, swept through all the federal agencies and PLAs are now a mandated requirement. The fact of the matter is, is that is not the way the executive order reads. The Department of Defense has, in fact, granted only one PLA since President Obama's executive order was issued in January of 2009. As Mr. Lynch said, that executive order exempts projects $25 million or less. I'd be happy to invite uh, members to my district to a military base where there's not been one PLA uh, contract, although we've had a number of projects uh, on our Navy base. So the fact is, is that the option exists today. This amendment would remove that option to the Department of Defense, which again has obviously exercised it very judiciously uh, because they've only done one PLA since January of 2009. Again, I would urge members to reject this amendment, which handcuffs the Department of Defense to set up pre-hiring agreements that can help veterans, local workforces, and apprenticeship programs for young Americans who want to get an opportunity to learn a building trade. And I yield back the balance of my time. Question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor say aye. 
Those opposed, no. Opinion no. of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentleman from Washington. Ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 9, printed in House Report 112-485. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, one minute. Does the gentleman have an amendment at the desk? Yes, uh, I ask that the amendment be reported. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number nine, printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. Conyers of Michigan. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, and the member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm joined uh, on this amendment by my colleague, uh, Mr. Keith Ellison. Uh, this amendment is simple in that it merely terminates the uh, most expensive uh, weapons system of the Department of Defense in its history. Uh, that is terminating the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter. Well, why? Well, because uh, they, there, there are many other planes that have capabilities that rival the F-35B and yet cost far less to buy and operate. Our amendment would save $50 billion over the life of this program. And so uh, the termination of the program has been recommended by so many groups, but I just mentioned a few, the project of government oversight, Taxpayers for Common Sense, the Cato Institute, the Center for American Progress, the Public Interest Research Group, the National Taxpayers Union, uh, our colleagues in the Senate, uh, Colburn, uh, and uh, the Bowles Simp Simpson Commission. Please join us in a very uh, simple uh, idea, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from California. I rise, Mr. Chairman, to claim the time in opposition. The, the gentleman is recognized for 